Are we ready to get this thing going? We are ready. Outstanding, outstanding. How's everyone doing? I'm Brian Francis, the Executive Director with the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. And I want to welcome you to the fourth uh, Midwives Education Summit. All right, so let, let's get it out the way. My mother, Charles Edda Francis, said, baby, you always need to thank people from the beginning. So I want to start out with the thank yous. Katie, Mary Hoffman, Mary Winston, Kayla, Shannis D. Heather, Mike Fickle, Kevin Harris. Thank y'all so much. There's been a lot of work put into this effort to have this virtual um, conference, and I'm so proud of what you've done. So thank you out the box. Our speakers that have volunteered to be here, thank you so much. And then thank you for signing up for this conference. We've had over 200 people sign up for this virtual conference. That's huge. And, and now let's get on to the welcome. All right. So here's the deal. Four years and 37 days. That's how long the midwife program has been with TDLR. It's just a little bitty baby. It's just still learning to walk. But man, haven't we come a long way? There's been a whole lot that's been accomplished. And what's been accomplished, in my opinion, is result of you, the midwives trusting us, of my staff respecting who you are and what you do and the importance of your roles. It's a relationship that just continues to thrive. You think about it, when, when the program first came to TDLR, there was in the law that a midwife could not be the presiding officer of their own board. It didn't make sense. And we were able to go to the legislature this session and get that change. And so, you know, Lori Fremgen is the first midwife to be the presiding officer over the midwife advisory board. It makes perfect sense. We're proud of those. Those are small accomplishments, but they are huge statements of respect. And that's exactly what this educational summit is about. It's about respecting this industry and knowing how important you are. Okay, now let's get, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Not, not peaches back here, but the elephant in the room. COVID-19, 2020, this year has been all the words, unexpected, unprecedented. Uh, I call them the uns, uh, unanticipated, all the uns you can, you can come up with. But there's something that came out of this moment that I think is so critical for this industry. I already knew, and you already knew, how essential you were. But now the world realizes how essential midwives are. Because as Lori and, and, and the ladies say, them babies don't care. Those babies are still coming. And here are the midwives stepping up because there are more mothers choosing to to have a birth at home because they're uncertain and they're unsure about the safety of having that baby in a hospital setting. So the midwives are stepping in to do what they've always done, to provide excellent and amazing care for the mothers and, and, and the children. So um, you're essential, you're important. This conference is essential and it's important. Now here's the secret, one day, we're gonna hand this conference back to you. This is TDLR's way of getting it started. We're not leaving anytime soon. Don't somebody start typing in some messages. Oh Lord, he's breaking up with us after four years and 37 days. That's not happening. But what I'm saying is that this is yours. We, this is always going to be yours. We just want to provide a space for it to grow and to be there. Okay, so my team is very nervous because I'm about to do an announcement. And the last time I did an announcement, um, I said, we we're going to have two summits a year and that just threw them off. They weren't ready for that. Here it is. Y'all leaning in. Lori, you leaning in. Brielle, you leaning in. I'm about to be a granddad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my son and his, his beautiful girlfriend, Leto, are, are expecting. And so uh, my wife, who is watching right now, she's decided that our names are going to be Lolly and Pop. Lollipop. That's what we're going to be. Uh, I'm Pop, if you didn't know. Uh, I'm going to be Pop's in that. And of course, they are exploring and, and, and talking to midwives in this process. Um, in fact, when the conversation first came up, they were uncertain. I'm like, whoa, baby, we regulate midwives. Let me tell you about them. They're amazing. They're nurturing. They're comforting. Uh, they get it done. 
and these women make me nervous. So here's the last note on the welcome, because Katie's already looking at her watch saying Brian's going too long. So now every day this week, no, actually for the last three weeks, my wife and my mother-in-law, who is a retired nurse, uh, have been um, encouraging me and inviting me to watch Call the Midwife, whether it's before dinner, during dinner, or after dinner. Uh, it's, 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 it's pretty shaky, but it's good training for me to, to continue to have my, my love uh, fest for, for the midwives. So I just want to welcome y'all. Uh, this is going to be a great summit. Let's take advantage of it. We have some interesting things, whether we're going to be doing polls or the Q and A's and typing it in. Let's make this virtual interactive and let's make it more than what people think it could be. So welcome and thank y'all for having me. Good morning, my name is Mary Hoffman and I would like to take a minute to acknowledge our advisory board members, several of whom who are with us in attendance today. The advisory board members were instrumental in helping us to develop the summit content and in providing recommendations for the wonderful speakers that we have lined up for you today. We thank you and truly appreciate working with such a passionate group of board members. And as a reminder, although we may have a quorum of, of advisory board members with us today, we will not be conducting official board business and we ask that you not discuss any board business during the summit. And now Kayla Potter will be providing a statement on continuing education. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. I am Kayla Potter with the Education and Examination Division, and I'm going to just quickly go over the requirements for earning five CE hours for attending today's event. Uh, to earn the CEs for today, you must have registered for the summit and provided your Texas midwife license number. Although the summit is open to all interested in attending, and you're, if you're not licensed with us in Texas, you'll receive a participation certificate instead of the CE certificate. I know some of you may be watching today's event in a group on a shared device, which is great, but you must still be logged into the summit on your own or a unique device because that's how we will uh, that's how we'll know whether or not you've attended the summit. You'll also need to stay logged in for the entire summit to earn the credit. Because we cannot give up partial CE hours, uh, we, as Brian said, are trying to make this interactive. We do encourage you to participate with the poll questions, as well as a final survey at the end. If for whatever reason you experience some technical difficulties with uh, entering and staying logged into the summit, we suggest logging out and then back in or ultimately using a new device. At the end, the certificates won't be ready immediately, but they should be ready sometime, uh, maybe Thursday of next week. If for whatever reason you don't receive an email from me, Check your spam folder first, and then if it's not in there, go ahead and shoot me an email at education at tdlr.texas.gov. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed today's event. Now, on to Katie. Good morning. I am Katie Bryce, Midwives Program Specialist for the Medical and, and um, Health Profession Section at TDLR. I'm going to be the host for today, and I'm happy to say that this is the fourth Midwives Educational Summit, like we, like Brian mentioned, that we've held in the last four years, uh, excuse me, two years. Um, the first summit was in Austin, the second was in Hearst, and the last summit was in San Marcos. Given everything that has happened in 2020, it's hard to believe that we were all able to meet at a conference center earlier this year. Um, a great benefit from these summits is the opportunity for the midwife community to reconnect and catch up with peers. I'm disappointed that we can't meet in person today to um, foster that, but I'm thrilled by the large number of attendees we have joining us virtually. We still wanna make the summit interactive, so we will have question and answer sessions at the end of each presentation. Um, so please hold your questions until the end. We're also going to take several polls throughout the day to encourage live participation. The instructions for joining our polls are on the screen now. 
And when you see a poll question, the instructions will also be written above the question. So hopefully you have had a chance to look at these questions, I mean, the instructions, and I'm going to start with our first question. What city are you joining us from today? You can just type in your answer and hopefully we'll get some responses. They should auto populate, but this is my first time doing the poll anywhere in a presentation. So um, if this doesn't work, then give me a minute and we'll try a different way to get to it. I am not seeing any answers yet. Is anybody else seeing any answers? Oh, Austin. Fort Worth. Leander, close to Austin. Weatherford, that's up by Fort Worth. San Antonio. Hutto, okay, it looks like we've got Central Texas covered and a lot of uh, North Texas, but not, oh, I'm still not seeing anybody from Houston. Is this by Houston? No. <laughs> this is going to be a geography, geography test for me. All right, this is Austin. Now we have Houston. Lots of people from Houston. Good to see. We haven't been able to have our summit in Houston yet because we were going to be planning um, the one that we're having virtually in the Houston area. So glad to see y'all are here. Okay. New Braunfels, Wimberley, Dripping Springs, Cleveland, Decatur. Great. I'm so glad to see so many different people joining us. Okay. I'm going to leave that up and just let it run while I continue to talk. Um, my manager, Heather, and I were able to attend the MANA conference held in Bastrop last fall. The theme of that conference was sustain. Sustain means to strengthen or support physically or mentally. Back in 2019, the MANA conference organizers recognized that being a midwife is full of joy, but also full of stress. As we all know, 2020 has brought on an entirely new set of challenges and stressors. Now, more than ever, it's important to strengthen your connections and support systems and to ensure that you're maintaining your emotional and physical well-being. Self-care is a real buzzword right now, and it seems simple enough, but it's easy to overlook when we're busy with work, taking care of others, or doing many of the things that life throws our way. Any activity that we do deliberately in order to take care of our mental, emotional, and physical health is considered self-care. And good self-care is key to lowering anxiety and improving your mood. Every day is a good day to practice better self-care. So we're going to incorporate some self-care techniques throughout the summit today, and I hope you'll all participate. Okay, we even have Brownsville, that's great. So right now we're gonna start moving into the presentation section. Um, Please remember that the views expressed in the presentations are those of the presenter. They do not constitute legal advice and they are not official opinions of the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. Now that that disclaimer is out of the way, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Roxanne Anderson. Ms. Anderson first became a midwife in Texas in 1989. During her training in the 1980s, she had the privilege of working with many senior midwives who are pioneers in both midwif excuse me, pioneers in midwifery, both in Texas and the nation. Watching their intuitive and natural style of attending women based on years of experience, she quickly developed her own faith in the ability of women to give birth and decided to focus on midwifery, her lifetime passion and calling. Roxanne took a sabbatical from actively practicing midwifery to focus on her family for several years and had three children of her own, all born at home with midwives. When she returned to full-time midwifery, Roxanne updated her clinical knowledge with local Texas midwives, as well as with internships in Senegal, West Africa, and the Philippines to gain cross-cultural experience. She became licensed to practice again in Texas in 2011 and has been practicing continually since that time. 
She has now attended approximately 700 community births in both homes and free standing birth centers in the DFW area. Currently, Roxanne works as an independent home birth midwife in DFW, serves on the Midwifery Advisory Board for the state of Texas, the Advisory Board for Abide Women's Health Services, and speaks on various topics at midwifery conferences. Okay, so now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Roxanne. Let me... Hold this up and stop sharing my screen so that Roxanne can start sharing hers. Just one second, please. There are so many presenters, I'm having to scroll down a ways to get down to Roxanne's name. Thank you so much, Katie. I am trying to get there, but I'm having to scroll down and it's not letting me scroll. So let me. Keep going. Sorry, I hope everyone is patient with us as we go through this for the first time. It's my first time speaking at a virtual conference too. So I think we'll all be having patience with each other. today. Um, Michael, are you able to help me here? I am not able to get the ball. There it is. Thank you. Great. There it is. Got so it. now we're going to share your presentation with us. All right. You have it? Do you not have yet. My... It okay. takes a little lag, but. Okay. You tell me when you have it and I will start. Do you also have my voice? You've got good audio? I have your voice, but we are not seeing the presentation. Okay. I'm sharing. I hit sharing screen and I can. Let's see. Share. Okay. Now it says that you are sharing content. All right. There we go. Awesome. Thank you so much. I also just really want to say thank you to TDLR for all the effort they put forth. Um, there's a lot of extra challenges with a virtual conference. There's challenges with all conferences, but virtual conferences have some special ones. And this is going to be my first time speaking at a virtual conference. So we're all figuring this out together. Um, my topic today is managing postpartum hemorrhage in the community birth setting. And managing postpartum hemorrhage is a thing and managing it in the community birth setting is another thing. So putting those two things together so that we have both halves of the both halves of the picture for the specific challenges that a community midwife is going to have when she manages a post postpartum hemorrhage at either a home birth setting or a birth center setting is the goal of this presentation. Um, we'll just start with a few definitions and clarifications. Postpartum hemorrhage occurring in the first 24 hours after delivery is known as primary or early postpartum hemorrhage. That's what we're going to be talking about today. The focus of this particular presentation. Um, and hang on a second, my PowerPoint is not responding. Sorry guys, there we go. Postpartum hemorrhage is one of the big five causes of maternal mortality, both in high and low per capita income countries. Uh, I know some of us think it might just be a situation in third world countries, but it's actually everywhere that obstetrical hemorrhage accounts for more than 10% of all maternal mortality and morbidity. So it's important for us to know how to manage that. Okay, I see what my issue is. There we go. 
Traditionally, postpartum hemorrhage was defined as greater than 500 milliliters of estimated blood loss in a vaginal delivery or greater than 1,000 milliliters estimated blood loss at time of cesarean. And this is the definition that a lot of us as midwives learned in our initial education. Since then, this has been updated by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, as cumulated blood loss greater, basically the, the new definition of postpartum hemorrhage is cumulated blood loss greater than 1,000 mil with signs and symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours of the birth process, regardless of the route of delivery. However, and this is where everything in this presentation is going to try to bring it back to practical applications in an out of hospital setting. So how, in the practical sense, blood loss at the time of vaginal delivery greater than 500 milliliters should still be considered abnormal with potential need for intervention. So for us in an out of hospital setting, we still, while we keep up with the updated definitions, that we have from ACOG. We also keep in touch with the reality of application that if we see more than 500 milliliters blood loss at the time of a delivery, we need to be intervening. And this is just kind of a further perspective on that. Um, a generalization that 1500 milliliters or six cups represents about 25% of a pregnant person's total blood volume. Uh, your average person's got about 6,000 milliliters of blood loss. It can have a lot of variability depending on the person's weight, and smaller people have less blood than this estimate to safely lose. So just sort of establishing what we'll be discussing today and what our parameters are. Also going to briefly cover what Texas law says. Um, our specific laws, when we go into the section on prenatal care, we have very little about risk factors for hemorrhage specifically. Um, we have to get our history. We have to do risk assessment. We have to do tests. All of those are going to give us information as to whether our client is at risk for postpartum hemorrhage. But specifically in the law, and you'll see anything specific to hemorrhage, I've highlighted in red. Specifically, we're looking for any other condition or symptom which could threaten the life of the mother or fetus as assessed by a midwife exercising reasonable skill and knowledge. So just to reiterate, while many of us have practice guidelines and those practice guidelines have been passed down and passed around and discussed with our students like if hemoglobin is less than 10, you shouldn't be delivering her at home. While that is a practice guideline that may be widely shared, it's not specifically in Texas law. We don't have any specific mention of anemia as a risk factor or of a lab that value below which we have to transfer according to law due to that in risk, increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage. This is where we exercise our reasonable skill and knowledge in this area. And we'll get more into that, but this is important. I remember um, sometimes some years back when part of our part of what we were required to do by law was to have our practice guidelines and many of us had similar practice guidelines. We had a, a, a general sense that something was in the law when it really wasn't because we were all using the same reasonable skill and knowledge. So I like to it's, all, it's never a bad thing to go back and see what the law actually says. And so then we move to the section of the law on labor and delivery. And in this area, you see we have a lot more that is directly applicable to postpartum hemorrhage. Um, these are the conditions that would necessitate immediate transfer emergency transfer from the home birth setting to the hospital if they are occurring in labor. So these are, we have 16 specific things. The 16th is a general. And we see that five of these have direct connection to postpartum hemorrhage. So number three is 
uncontrolled hemorrhage. And the, the items that are in brackets are my clarifications to the law. Everything else is a direct quote from the Texas law, except for the part in brackets, which is um, what I've added to show its correlation to hemorrhage. Uh, severe abdominal pain inconsistent with normal labor. This can be an indication of an occult or hidden hemorrhage. Evidence of maternal shock, many times that is caused by hemorrhage. Lacerations requiring repair beyond the scope of practice of the midwife. This may also be bleeding heavily or a retained placenta, which may be accompanied by hemorrhage. All of these necessitate immediate transfer. So when we look at number three and we see that it's uncontrolled hemorrhage as our, our general, our goal is that we, if we see a hemorrhage start, that we control it. If it is controllable, we want to be able to control that in the home setting and get ahead of it in the home setting so that we don't have an uncontrolled hemorrhage. So on the one hand, we want to know when it's time to go to the hospital. On the other hand, we want to know how to prevent that if we can see far enough ahead and get ahead of things soon enough. So with that in mind, let's do a quick anatomy and physiology review on the four T's. These are our causes of hemorrhage. 70 percent. 70%, so the four T's are the four, we're dividing up our four root causes of hemorrhage. So the number one is tone. Our first T is tone, an atonic uterus, a uterus that is not clamped down, 70%. Number two is trauma. 20% of bleeding will be coming from vaginal or cervical tears or a uterine rupture. Tissue is our third T. Retained tissue, invasive placenta, 9%. And thrombin. Coagulopathies, ble bleeding disorders. Um, and honest, this is our 1%. And these are the ones that hopefully have been risked out. If, if they're known, they should have been risked out. Occasionally, something may not have been known in a patient's history. This is why we do our best to take an extensive um, health history at the time we take someone into care. We would find out if any of these things had happened in any of their previous deliveries. Um, Von Willenbrand's disease is one of the coagulopathies. You can hear me, coagulopathies. And um, or hemophilia, A or B. Um, we're not talking about uh, Factor five Leiden, which is the increased tendency to clot. That's the opposite, but also something that would need to be taken into consideration. So when we break down, why is a woman bleeding? Why are we having postpartum hemorrhage that everybody will see from at one point or another? The, the main reason, 70% of the reason is it's coming from the uterus. 20% it's coming from a tear. 9% it's coming from something that's been retained in the uterus and 1% a thrombin issue. So we can see where we're going to be focusing a lot of our attention in our 70%. So let's start looking at the beginning before we get to the hemorrhage. Let's look at our most common risk factors that we have. So there's the first set of risk factors that we can know in advance by labs, by ultrasounds, and by taking a history. This is where risk assessment is one of the most important parts of good midwifery, looking ahead and either solving or eliminating risks. So let's look at the ones we would know either from our very first intake with a new patient or client or throughout her care. Her labs, if her hematocrit is less than 30, correlating to a hemoglobin of less than 10, that is a risk factor for hemorrhage. If her platelets are less than 100, if she has a low lying placenta, we know we cannot deliver a woman out of the hospital if the placenta is over the cervix. 
So if somebody has a low-lying placenta, has some follow-up sonograms, and we see, okay, it's not over the cervix, but it is low-lying within a couple of centimeters, four centimeters, why would that still be a risk? The lower uterine segment is less vascular and has less perfusion to the placenta. So we know that this could potentially be more of a risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Um, history is huge. When a woman's had babies before, had hemorrhage before, we make a note of that. The woman has large uterine fibroids. Those can contribute to bleeding, both in pregnancy and postpartum. A high BMI means a woman's uterus is going to be unable to contract as efficiently after birth in order to clamp down and prevent bleeding. So we take those into considerations. It doesn't mean we rule her out. It means that we are aware that that could be a risk factor. So keep in mind um, the prevalence, the dominance of uterine atony in all cases of postpartum hemorrhage. We are looking at things that keep our uterus from contracting, things that keep our uterus from being firm. These are, this is the main reason we're going to have postpartum hemorrhage. So let's look at those factors. Multiple de multiple gestation, our uterus is stretched out larger, and therefore when the babies come out and the placenta comes out, we're going to have a more, uh, the uterus is going to have to work harder in order to clamp down, and also there's going to be more surface where the placentas were that are going to need to clamp off. When a woman has had greater than four vaginal births, her uterus is more stretched out and requires more effort in order to clamp down and stop bleeding afterwards. If a woman has fibroids, that's also going to affect the uterus's ability to clamp down and stop bleeding after birth. Same thing with a large baby. Anything that stretches the uterus larger. You see the correlation, multiple gestation, larger. Once a woman's had more babies, her uterus is stretched out larger. Fibroids, same. Baby, same. Extra amniotic fluid, also same. High BMI, same. And then we have, these are things that we would know before we went into labor. And then we have, we come down to what we can know ahead of time. And then we come down to what may happen in the course of the birth that makes a woman more prone to hemorrhage afterwards and a tired uterus from a prolonged labor so let's look at these let's go from things that we know in advance to contributing factors to risk factors that show up in labor a prolonged first stage of labor um, Prolonged can be very different from person to person and definition to definition. So I hesitate to put an hour, a certain hour number on what would be considered clinically prolonged. For one woman, 18 hours can be prolonged. For another woman, 24. We know that when women, when for, women are having their first babies and they are not induced, they're allowed to go into labor spontaneously, and then their labor is not augmented with Pitocin or other artificial means. It's not unusual from, for a first time mom from first contraction to holding her baby in her arms. We know that, that it's not unusual for that to be 24 hours um, by the time you put everything together, but a lot, that 24 hours can look very different from person to person. It could be very gradual and very gentle for one person and very intense for another person, depending on how fast their contractions got close together and a lot of other individual factors. But most midwives have a sense when their mom's getting tired. We work really hard to prevent maternal exhaustion, which again can prevent we're thinking ahead to keep our mom hydrated, to keep her well uh, nourished during labor. That can mitigate some of the physical side effects of a prolonged first stage of labor, allowing her to rest. 
but there is a physiological reality in spite of all our best efforts of what's happening on the inside that we need to be aware of. As anything that goes past 24 hours can certainly be considered prolonged. Uh, then there's the second stage of labor, which may be, may be prolonged when the first one wasn't, or maybe prolonged along with a first stage that was also prolonged. So we need to think compound risk there if those are both happening at the same time. So our, our second stage of labor, of course, is when our mom starts pushing. Really normal for that to take an hour to two with a first baby. When a woman has to push longer than two hours, we're probably putting extra strain on the uterus, which may also cause it to have trouble clamping down afterwards. So we want to keep that into consideration. A shoulder dystocia, lacerations, retained or partially retained placenta. And all of us who've been practicing for a while know that a lot of these things can go together. You have a long first stage, a long second stage, it leads to a shoulder dystocia. You most certainly are going to have to manage some bleeding afterwards. Those three can all go together. So those are situations where we would know we would know we're more likely to need to control some bleeding. And you should always know when you're with your mom in labor, you should always know what is my mom's hemoglobin, what is my patient's hemoglobin and hematocrit, because that could be stacked on top of what's happening in labor. Where is her placenta? What are her platelets? Did she have a hemorrhage last time? And those are not things that make us fearful in management. That's information that helps us to be on top of things. So keeping everything in mind ahead of time, our risk factors is important. So we're going to do how much prevention we can and how much planning we can. Preventing and planning can do a lot in the way we either prevent or effectively manage our postpartum hemorrhages. And that's where we come to the being prepared, which I think is one of the most, this is, for the out of hospital midwife, this is where we shine and this is also where the rubber, where the rubber meets the road and what can make all the difference in outcome is how we choose to be prepared. We are there's some complications we prepare for that we don't know if we're going to see in our lifetime. However, statistically, we're going to see postpartum hemorrhages. So this is something we absolutely want to be prepared for. We always want to be one step ahead of our complications whenever possible in the birth setting. We do not have a button that we can push and bring somebody into our room immediately. So we need to be a couple of steps ahead, if not one, then two. As we already talked about, knowing the risk factors of your client, both pre-existing and those may, that may develop in labor, is a huge part of that. We want to consider, and I'm going to, there will be a whole slide and discussion of this a little bit later in the presentation. We want to consider applying AMSTL, which stands for active management third stage of labor in their presence of postpartum hemorrhage risk factors. If when you've done her history, if she's had a previous hemorrhage, I would strongly encourage you to consider this. That's also knowing that it happened before this gives you a chance to discuss it with your client in advance and gain consent added as a part of your birth plan. We'll talk about a little bit later what that looks like. Another part of being prepared is checking your birth bag or birth center med kit to ensure your medications are stocked and unexpired before each birth. Uh, I usually recommend there should be a monthly general check. And then at the birth, there should be a specific check. Everything should be laid out. Everything should be checked. A lot of midwives, both birth center and home birth midwives, I know have their Pitocin, have one dose of Pitocin pre-drawn. This does not affect the efficacy. It's a really good idea. You want to just make sure you keep track of when that was drawn, both the lot number and the expiration date, but having that ready to go is a great way to be prepared. Always make sure you have a well-trained assistant, uh, whether that's another licensed midwife, uh, birth assistant, um, an advanced uh, student, 
you want to make sure you have somebody there who knows how to manage hemorrhage with you. And you're going to communicate with them in advance and decide the care plan, the roles and responsibilities. If you've, if your client has a low hemoglobin, the assistant would be informed of that. You would have a discussion. She has a tendency to bleed. We have our Pitocin right here. You're going to be the one to give her that shot to manage it. Having all that planned in advance is going to be a huge part of not having a, a, a huge three alarm fire. Another thing is knowing how far you are from the hospital and having the phone number and directions in both you and your assistant's phone. Some home birth midwives that I know have all this printed out as part of the client's birth plan that they also have in their possession. If we need to go to a hospital, this is the hospital we will go to. This is the address of the hospital. This is the phone number of the hospital. This is how that's going to happen. Um, some people feel that that is a fear tactic. I personally don't. I feel like the most anxiety and fear comes when there's an unknown. And when we discuss, this is how we're going to prevent hemorrhage. If we can't prevent hemorrhage, this is where we need to go is a part of making sure that you have a good outcome. So let's talk a little bit about AMSTEL, um, Active Management Third Stage of Labor. This is something that was not on the table when I first did my initial midwifery training back in the 80s, but has since come it started, it has, it has since become a thing that I feel like is an amazing tool for out of hospital midwives. It is supported and promoted by the World Health Organization as an effective means of reducing postpartum hemorrhage. I learned about it uh, initially years ago through Mercy in Action workshops. Um, they are an organization that works primarily in third world countries where women are always have According to the director, they're always anemic and they always are at risk for hemorrhage. And so they started looking and doing very specific studies on the effectiveness of Amstel in preventing postpartum hemorrhage in the, in the presence of known risk factors. So it's basically getting ahead of it. And instead of waiting for that first gush of blood to start treating with medications, you know that she is likely to bleed, and so you give her Pitocin immediately after the birth. Literally, the baby comes out, goes on mom skin to skin, and 10 units of Pitocin is injected immediately after the birth, before the placenta. Um, it takes five to seven minutes usually for that to start taking effect and the woman to start cramping. You use controlled cord traction to deliver the placenta, and then do our uterine bundle massage as we always would after that. You do not have to cut the cord. In the initial um, introduction of Amstel, one of the steps was to cut the cord three to five minutes after the birth, which does not, that step does not have to be done to get all the benefits because we don't, we don't want to lose one thing to gain another. So we don't have to lose the cord blood with the needed oxygen and nutrients baby needs in order to get the benefits of Amstel. Uh, so this is, this, this has a very specific, I'll, I'll try that again. These have, these are the three very specific steps of Amstel. I've seen them varied the key component is giving the Pitocin before the placenta to help it to come out more quickly um, and with less bleeding. That is the, that's the main thing. With the controlled cord traction, this is something most midwives are utilizing anyway. Massaging uterine fundus after the placenta is delivered is something we would do under any circumstances. The main thing that is different about Amstel is that we're administering our Pitocin before the placenta is delivered. We're giving it a, as soon as the baby is born before the placenta is delivered to help the uterus to release the placenta more quickly and with less bleeding in the process. Um, I, as a more traditionally trained midwife, I remember 
I would like to talk just just pause a second here. Um, in the 80s, it was a matter of pride how little Pitocin you could use. A midwife who didn't have to use Pitocin was a better midwife. A midwife who used more Pitocin was more medical. Um, and it, it, was, it, it was a sort of a status symbol. I haven't had to use Pitocin all year. I only had to give one shot of Pitocin all year. And so in some ways, because we're trying to be natural and non-medical, and one of the reasons birth moved out of hospital settings into home birth settings, women were trying to avoid unnecessary interventions, including the use of Pitocin as an induction agent. So even the word Pitocin had this negative association. Women didn't associate it with a simple shot that would keep them from bleeding too much. They associated it with this medical thing that they're trying to get away from. And I think that very much led to a stigma in the midwifery community against using it in a completely different application for a completely different purpose. Um, also, because Pitocin, when it's given in an IV form, and it's been in a woman's system for long periods of time, studies have shown that this can affect how a woman's milk comes in. And so that also led to concerns about, well, would 10 units of Pitocin IM have the same effect, which it doesn't. It's, there's no studies that show that it does. It's incredibly localized and specific. It's not in the system long enough or systemically enough to affect a woman's milk supply or how that milk comes in. There aren't any studies that show that. But again, because of association, I have seen midwives hesitate uh, to use Pitocin either in an Amstel form or even, even after uh, the placenta is out when bleeding occurs. So I just wanted to sort of, um, demystify that or destigmatize that, that giving Pitocin is not too medical. Um, managing a hemorrhage is part of what we do. A hemorrhage isn't natural and we want to manage it and get back on the natural track as soon as possible. Um, so let's go to our hemorrhage prevention tips because again, midwives, we'd rather prevent a hemorrhage then manage one any day of the week, all of us. So let's go to somebody who's everything is doing great. We want to do everything we can to prevent this woman for, from bleeding so that we don't have anything to manage. One of the biggest things we can do is use birth physiology to our advantage. When a woman is in labor she all and she's gone into labor spontaneously, all of her hormones are on board to help her deliver that baby. All of her hormones are also on board to help her deliver that placenta. They will help facilitate third stage the same way her body pr produced oxytocin to make contractions to deliver her baby. They are going to produce contractions to help her deliver her placenta. The best thing we can do is not to interrupt or distract them. In other words, let's not celebrate or have this sense of completion until baby is actually born. So we want to keep our room quiet the same way we were while baby's being born. We don't want to get things, turn on lights and make things loud. If the parents want to celebrate, that's awesome. Their moment of cheering, crying, holding their baby is for them. But you want to keep out of that hormonal cocktail or from distracting it as much as possible. You're making sure baby's stable, you're making sure mom's stable, but you're not talking any more than necessary, touching any more than necessary, making noise in the room any more than necessary. The longer you can keep that mom in her primitive brain, the more things are going to happen smoothly and instinctively. So no unnecessary talking or noise in the birthing room. There's things, you know, that we immediately are like, let's get started. Let's drain the birth tub. Let's open the packages. Let's start cleaning things up. The baby's out. Just wait. Kind of keep the keep the movement in the room to a minimum. And I have seen this really make a difference. The, the quieter you can keep things between the birth of the baby and the birth of the placenta, 
the more likely that is to happen without incident. So we're keeping her in her primitive brain where she does her best work for birth and her best work for delivering her placenta. You wanna am avoid moving or disturbing the mother as much as possible. The fact that she's holding her baby is also, even the act of having that baby skin to skin is going to encourage that placenta to come out. So baby should be with mom, mom should be holding baby. Really encourage waiting to check the perineum because if anything is going to pull a mom out of her euphoria of just having delivered her baby and being high on oxytocin, it's suddenly feeling rough gauze, pulling blood clots away from her perineum where she just pushed her baby out. That is going to pull a woman out of her primitive brain faster than anything I know. And suddenly, and I've seen it so many times, you want to, we, we all want to make sure the mom didn't tear. Unless we see bleeding that we think may be coming from the perineum and we need to get a good look in order to assess that, that would be the exception. If things are normal, just wait because you can pull a mom quicker than anything by starting to do an exam at that point. And that literally will disturb the process and prolong your third stage of labor by doing that. So maintain watchful waiting for your placenta. You're not done until the placenta comes. And so this is a place where you also don't really wanna take your eyes at the same time that we're not interfering, we're also not getting distracted. As a primary midwife, you're basically watching the area under her perineum on, while she's celebrating with her baby. We're maintaining watchful waiting, watching to see if there's any bleeding, watching for signs that that placenta is starting to detach. This is huge. Avoid what I believe it was Elizabeth Davis coin, in Heart and Hands coined the term, avoid fundus fiddling. Avoid massaging the uterus. This is a huge thing that can in, inevitably, um, inadvertently trigger a hemorrhage. Um, the placenta will detach on its own. If you wanna do a fundal check, and lightly lay your hand on the fundus to see if it's still high is one thing, but to start massaging it, to start messing around to try to help that placenta come off, this is one of the biggest um, differences between the practice of obstetrics and the practice of midwifery. Um, every midwifery text um, from Varney to Miles to Heart and Hands, uh, strongly admonishes midwives to avoid fundus fiddling. This is where we, again, it's an interference in the natural process of labor. And when we try to rush, the, the purpose of fundus fiddling, the purpose of an obstetrician reaching up and starting to massage the uterus quickly and pulling on the cord is to get the placenta out quickly. In a hospital setting, that woman has a, an IV, most likely with Pitocin running, um, which is kind of the backup plan that even if we rush the placenta and cause more bleeding, we've got a lot of Pitocin in her system to prevent a hemorrhage. We do not have that generally. Um, there's a few situations where a woman might already have an IV in a home birth or out of um, hospital birth setting, but not usually. And so we want to make sure that we're not doing anything to contribute to starting up a hemorrhage that doesn't have to happen. So that would be us keeping our watchful waiting and avoid the massaging or pressing on the fundus, the top of the uterus before the placenta comes out. Um, we're gonna run through, we have, before we have our break, we're gonna quickly run through the medications and their indications. Pitocin, um, we think of it as, you know, again, I was telling you, it kind of had that evil connotation when we think of it as inducing labors that don't need to be induced, but it is our number one life-saving pharmaceutical for controlling hemorrhage. And so when we have an emergency hemorrhage, when a woman is bleeding and we need to stop it as soon as possible, I am 
intramuscular Pitocin should always be the first drug administered. And we'll get into why as we move along, but this, there's different steps for in hospital management and out of hospital management. When we're in an out of hospital setting, Pitocin is going to work the fastest and the best. And if we have it, we need to use it first and use it correctly. Um, it's the fastest acting and it has the least number of side effects. It affects the upper segment of the uterus, uh, the myometrium, it causes it to contract rhythmically. That is typically why it works so well for Amstel. It's helping that placenta to detach. Um, your dosage is 10 mil and you're injecting that. Time to take effect three to five minutes, effective for two to three hours. Most of us think of it as quickly here and quickly gone, but it actually, the effects will, will last for two to three hours. It can be used both before and after placental delivery. It can be re-administered every seven to 10 minutes up to three doses. Um, this is not a law. A lot of us had in our practice guidelines that we had to transport if we used three doses and didn't see effect. That is not in the law. However, Generally, if we've given three doses of Pitocin and along with other measures, it has not been effective. That's a good indicator that you're going to need to transport. Also addressing the fact the literature all recommends seven to 10 minutes between injections. I know in emergency situations, all of us have given it as close together as five minutes without um, side effect. but I, it's always good to go back to the the literature and the inserts and the correct guidelines are every since each dose should be seven to 10 minutes apart if we're re-administering it by injection. We can also put it in our LR IV fluid um, if we've got somebody that's trickle bleeding. And there are side effects to IM Pitocin are super rare, but occasionally nausea and vomiting have been reported. Our next drug is methogen, um, also known as ergotrate. In the 80s, we had this a lot in a pill form. Um, right now, the only way that I'm aware of that it's available in the US is by injection. Uh, Vicki Penwell of Mercy in Action calls this an ice cream drug because it is both expensive and needs refrigeration. Um, it does enter the breast milk um, and it has more side effects. We can't use it if mom has high blood pressure or pre-E is a concern. We cannot deliver, give it before the placenta is delivered because it affects a completely different set of muscles than the Pitocin does. Um, it, causes, it causes generalized smooth muscle contractions in which the upper and lower segments of the uterus contract tectonically. So basically, if you gave that before your placenta, you could close things off and make it more difficult for the placenta to be delivered. Um, it's, it's the kind of thing you would use if you got your placenta out and suspected that you might have some membranes uh, retained or if you had a trickle bleed is one way that that might be utilized. The administration is 0.2 milligrams IM every two to three hours as needed for a maximum of three doses. Um, I personally have never given anybody more than one in a, in a community birth setting along with other medications. Then we have Cytotec, um, which has a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about Cytotec. Um, it was not originally designed as an anti-hemorrhagic, um, its original use was the prevention of NSA-induced ulcers, but it is now widely used in all across the board obstetrically. Um, it has a different action than both Pitocin and Methogen. It increases overall uterine tone. Hospitals use it for labor induction or cervical ripening. Um, and we've all had clients that have had to go to the hospital be induced and they either gave them Cytotec orally or or put it up by their cervix. This is absolutely not permitted in community birth settings by licensed midwives. Um, there's some question as to whether it should be done in hospital, but as far as our context goes, the only time we would be legally using Cytotec is postpartum after the baby's born anti-hemorrhagic. The dosage for postpartum hemorrhage is 800 micrograms. 
Um, oral is the most effective studies have shown, although it's been given both rectally and vaginally studies have shown that oral is the most effective. Some midwives also give a 600 microgram dose. The correct dosage for postpartum hemorrhage is 800. 600 may be effective as well by choice, even though the correct dosage per literature is 800. Anything less than that is not. Um, because um, controlling hemorrhage is an off label use for Cytotec. We don't have, and it will take effect we, with our both of our Pitocin and our Methogen. We can say this is how long it takes to affect, and then the same. But Cytotec is an off label use, so we don't have the literature does not give us the studies do not give us quite as specific. Um, the literature indicates that 20 minutes is average. Practically, I've seen it work faster. Um, midwives say that they believe it works faster, but in general, we may expect it to take as long as 20 minutes. And this is why Cytotec is never used first when Pitocin is available. Um, if you're a research geek, you can look up studies that were done. I have one here and it's about time for a break, so I won't go into it, but basically they did a lot of studies overseas with Cytotec because it was cheap um, and because it didn't require for duration trying to reduce maternal mortality rate. Um, and basically, they did not, a couple of studies found that it might be equal, but a lot of them found that it was not as effective as Pitocin and that women had a lot more side effects from it. They were more likely to require additional uterotonic drugs, blood transfusions, flood, fluid, plasma. A lot of side effects, um, the side effects also shivering they had 47% more shivering, 44% more fever, 5% uh, more vomiting. We did get more potential side effects with them as well. So while all of us may choose to use it at some time, we also want to know what our potential side effects are and the benefits versus, versus um, concerns over that one. TXA is the only Antihemorrhagic currently widely carried on ambulances. Most of us are not going to have this in our arsenal, but just for the record, it has a it has again another action than either the pitocin, the methogen, or the side attack. In other words, they can all be used um, because this is a blood clotting agent. It does not directly affect the uterus. Um, it is given only in an IV and Midwives who are transporting could request your ambulance crew to use them. If we have it in our community setting and we were using it because our other three anti-hemorrhagic, we've used our Pitocin, Cytotec, Methogen potentially combination, and we're stabilizing her with TXA, it means we're on our way to the hospital. It doesn't mean that we're keeping her at home. Uh, some of us back in the day, when we had a lot less Pitocin, used mistletoe tincture, which is probably the strongest herbal uterine tonic that we have. You can't use it before the baby's born, just like Pitocin. Um, we don't have as many studies because our, with our drugs, we can have studies. With our herbs, we have anecdotal knowledge that's been passed down from generation to generation. Um, so whenever we have a choice, I strongly recommend that we do make sure we carry Pitocin. Um, occasionally you'll get a client that's strongly opposed to that. And you might offer to try mistletoe first. Um, you'll see I've written out the dosage here. Originally, the dosage uh, on this came from um, a very old text called Polly's Birth Book. Um, and the combination of mistletoe, which causes uterine contractions, and shepherd's purse, which causes blood clotting, can be really effective, particularly if it's used to have for a woman as a prevention. So she delivers her baby and she drinks both of these in some juice at bedside. It can help. Mistletoe can also be given like you would give Pitocin to help your placenta come out. Um, it's important to recommend to, to realize that while as midwives, we like to use herbs. We don't have the studies that of efficacy that we have, like we have with our Pitocin and Methogen and Cytotec. 
So there's a lot of individual responses that our clients may have, but it's important to know that these are out there as well. Arnica is similar. It's another homeopathic that can help with, I would never recommend this for sole management of a clinical hemorrhage, but if you've got somebody who's got slightly heavy bleeding and prefers natural means and you want to help control that, that's an option as well. This is an amazing anti-shock garment. It was originally designed for third world countries in order to be able uh, to control hemorrhage on a woman in time to get her to a hospital, which might be two to three hours away. Um, would probably be a great option to use if you're further away from a hospital. I would hope, according to best community birth standards, that you're always within 30 minutes of a hospital. But just to let you know, this is another tool that's out there. It requires specific training to use, and I've taken it. It's really cool. Basically shunts blood up to the essential organs in a woman's body and keeps her from going into shock. They are a little bit hard to find in America. You, because they're more designed for third world countries, they cost about $200. It's basically something you would carry for that once in a lifetime um, emergency that you hope you never have. And this is a summary of everything that I just mentioned. This is the final slide before our break. Um, IVs are a topic all by themselves. Um, they're an important tool in managing hemorrhage out of the hospital. And I strongly recommend that every community midwife become skilled in using IVs. They can be used both to manage a hemorrhage while it's happening and to help the mother recover well afterwards. It is an advanced skill. It does require training. Um, originally, they were also had the stigma of being a very medical thing, but they could also be a tool that would help our mom be able to be stabilized at home in an effective manner. So I encourage all the community midwives to get um, training for IVs. And that is where we're stopping for our break. I think this is where I turn it back over to Katie to, turn, to take over. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, I see a few hands up, but I'd like to remind you that we are only able to take questions at the end of each presentation. So if you have questions that come up, please just jot them down and save them until the end of the presentation. The second half of this presentation, I went, there's absolutely no way to cover like every, every scenario a postpartum hemorrhage might show up in or what the steps might be. But I created uh, two of the most common ones to go through. I think if you have the main steps in your head, you can vary them according to individual situation. So that's what these are now scenarios, which we know in real life, every scenario may not follow the exact steps, but having uh, the major ones fixed in our mind will help us uh, when the time comes. The biggest thing is to avoid denial and delay. Um, psychologists tell us that when we're faced with something life threatening, the first part of our brain is to, the first response of our brain is to go into denial. This isn't happening. You know, that's whether there's a tidal wave coming toward us or whether suddenly we have that life threatening complication we've been practicing our whole life for and now we just see it in front of our face for the first time. The first brain response is denial. Nah, this isn't it, can't be it. So we have to, as healthcare professionals, override that. And if you see blood, it's a hemorrhage, deal with it. Don't go into denial and wait because what you do quickly can have a huge impact on your overall income, overall um, outcome rather. So avoid denying that you're seeing what you're seeing. If you have a question in your mind that you have a hemorrhage, You've been trained to recognize that. You need to trust that part of your brain and, and go into action. The other part, which I already touched on, and it's, um, you can't, I can't really emphasize this enough when talking to my community. Remember, there is no such thing as being too medical when handling a hemorrhage. Um, one of the stigmas we face is, are we too, are we becoming medwives? Are we using too many pharmaceuticals? Are we becoming too medical? 
let's move back from that and realize that a hemorrhage isn't normal. When things are normal, and I'm totally borrowing this from Vicki Penwell because I've learned so much from her about both respecting normal and handling emergencies. When things are normal, you cannot be too hands off. When you're having an emergency, you cannot be too hands on. You cannot be too medical. It is not normal to have a hemorrhage. So our job is to handle it as efficiently and quickly as possible so that we can get back on track with normal, so that we can get back on track with being non-interventive. The sooner we manage a hemorrhage, the sooner that woman can enjoy her postpartum, the more blood we keep in our body, the better she's gonna feel for the next six weeks and the easier breastfeeding is gonna go. So don't let yourself go into denial and delay your response. Don't let the stigma of if I give Pitocin again, I just gave it yesterday, I'm being too medical or the other midwives will think I'm too medical or it'll get out that I'm being too medical because I'm giving Pitocin. Remember that our job is to respond to what we see. And I will say this too, as someone who's been practicing midwifery now for over 30 years, with a big break in the middle, um, I see more of everything now than I used to. So where I might, I, I do remember not needing to use Pitocin as much as I do now. I think in general, people are not as healthy and there's a lot of other environmental factors but our job is to manage what is given us. If we've done our risk assessment properly, if we've done our training properly, if we're prepared, we need to use all of that when we need to use it and not be afraid of using it. Um, that's my little soapbox on that. So let's move into our first scenario. Um, baby's born. And within three minutes, you see a large gush of blood. I'm uh, defining large in this situation as 350 milliliters or more. Um, it's good to be good at estimating blood loss on the spot. So big gush of blood, that's more than what would, we would typically see as separation gush, uh, which we, within three minutes you might see um, a third that much that tells us the placenta is ready to come out in a normal fashion, but that much would be considered more than normal. So what do we do? You see too much blood coming fast. Your first response should be Pitocin. A fast act, a fast hemorrhage needs to get the quickest possible response. The answer is always Pitocin. Fast response, Pitocin. Big hemorrhage, Pitocin. The answer is Pitocin. I am. So you start with your 10 units, I am, and perhaps you already have that drawn up at bedside. Perhaps you've already discussed that with your assistant and she knew that she might need to do that. So she was ready to go. That gets injected. As soon as, basically the only way to get her to stop bleeding at this point is for the placenta to come out. So we wanna see, did our placenta just detach really quickly and is it right there? And can I just slip it out and get this hemorrhage controlled? So the first thing was to give her Pitocin. The second thing is to check and see if our placenta is detached by doing controlled cord traction. All midwives know this is not jerking on the cord. This is firmly and steadily pulling the cord, perhaps at the same time that we're guarding the uterus to make sure we're not pulling too hard. And focus on delivering the placenta. The bleeding cannot be controlled until it is out. The placenta, the um, Pitocin is gonna cause the mother to cramp. We're gonna encourage her to push. Remember, you're watching, you're not just watching your bleeding, you're watching your patient. If she arches her back and indicates pain with the cord traction, you want to relax on the cord and wait for her to have another contraction. It should not cause her intense pain for you to get that placenta out. If the placenta is only partially detached, which may be the case, in fact, it's most uh, probably the case if you've seen that much blood, you've at least got a partially detached placenta. You don't wanna force delivery because this can potentially cause your placenta to tear, not be fully delivered, the cord to avulse or pop off or the hemorrhage to get worse as you're irritating it. 
this is a moment where you're taking a deep breath. You've already given your Pitocin. You know it's going to start working. You know you're going to get this out. You're going to keep, you're also going to work really hard at keeping the atmosphere calm. You're very alert, but you're also keeping things calm. You may be making eye contact with your mom and saying, I need to get this placenta out. We're going to get this out, but you, you want to keep things calm. In this scenario, I'm going to assume that your placenta came out pretty soon, which is, is the desired result of this and the usual result of this. So. The minute that placenta is out, as we all know, this is where we perform our strong fundal massage. We don't do this before the placenta is out. We do this after the placenta comes out. I, because this is the one part of midwifery that is never gentle when we try so hard to be gentle on everything, I usually take a moment to look into her eyes and say, I'm really sorry, this is going to hurt just for a minute, because especially if she's been bleeding, we need to do some very deep massage and make sure that all clots are out. If it's high or boggy, which means it's still got clots in there, we're gonna have to massage that down firmly, press out clots, keep track of blood loss. This is huge. We already, if we're already managing a hemorrhage, we already know that we had more than we should have. We wanna make sure everything counts. Everything counts and how it affects our patient. So we wanna be keeping track of this. This is something both the midwife and the assistant should be tuned into. As soon as you've done your fundal massage, the next thing is to take the vitals and see how mom has tolerated her blood loss and get some fluids into her. You're watching how she's reacting to this. Different women tolerate different amounts of blood loss differently. So we are looking carefully, does she have pale lips, disorientation? Um, is she feeling faint or woozy? Is she having ringing in her ears? Um, regardless of how much blood has been lost, if your patient is reacting, you need to take that as your indicator of what you need to do. Maybe she hasn't lost um, over 500. Maybe she's right at the line, but if she's Showing signs of shock, that's an indicator that she needs more intervention. You wanna lower her head, raise her feet, potentially run an IV. This is where IVs come in really handy. Um, even if bleeding's controlled, that may be a really important part. Um, I've added another step here. Let's say the placenta comes out and she's still not controlled. At this point, you would want her bleeding to be essentially stopped and anything short of that would require more intervention. For me, my next step would be a second dose of 10 units of Pitocin um, intramuscularly. Um, I would definitely want an IV running at this point. Um, keeping at this point, you're not gonna, because we know that we're managing, we're managing an active hemorrhage. We are going to keep our eyes and our hands on the mom until things have taken effect and everything is fully under control. So this is a, I would consider this a really typical um, positive outcome hemorrhage management scenario. Um, and then we want to just kind of think through a little bit reasons a woman might continue to bleed in this scenario after the placenta has been delivered. Let's say you get that placenta out and blood just keeps coming either steadily, intermittently. Um, she's trying to nurse the baby and still having blood coming out. It's very, this is a very common reason. If there are clots stuck at the cervical opening inside the vagina, and this is, remember, our four T's that we talked about, that's affecting tone. Those clots are preventing the uterus from clamping down and achieving tone, and that's why she's continuing to bleed. So the solution to that would be to sweep for clots. Um, you put on a fresh sterile glove. You use two fingers to reach inside very gently, clear the vaginal vault of of clots uh, to see if that's what's preventing the cervix from closing down and her to stop bleeding. Uh, other reasons she might continue to bleed in this setting would be a full bladder. We've been pushing fluids on her to keep her from going into shock, hopefully in labor as well. 
When the bladder is full, it keeps the uterus from clamping down, again affecting tone. So as we start ticking off the reasons why our mom may still be bleeding, one of the top reasons would be a full bladder. So our answer to that is if it's extended, uh, we're going to bring her a bedpan to empty her bladder while laying down. Hopefully she can do that. In an extreme case, we can use a catheter. If a woman has been bleeding, we can't get her up to go to the toilet yet. She's not going to be ready for that. So we're going to have to find a way to empty her bladder without getting her up. Um, it's, it is more difficult for a woman to urinate laying down. Um, but again, and running a catheter, it, yes, it's a medical thing. But if that's the only way that we can get fluid out of her bladder to allow her uterus to clamp down, to allow her bleeding to become controlled, then that's the logical next step that we need to take. Uh, vaginal tears, maybe the bleeding we're still seeing is not coming from her uterus. Maybe she has a tear. This is where we're going to get on our sterile gloves, do a very careful exam and suture if necessary. If there's um, anything that needs counter pressure in order to prevent bleeding until we're able to suture, that's a great assistant job. Get a gauze pad, put pressure on the area that's bleeding until the midwife can get her uh, sterile field ready and everything ready to suture. That's going to be an important part, um, important thing to rule out at this point. What else might be keeping her bleeding? She might have retained placenta fragments, which would be tissue. So these are we're got tone, tone, trauma, and tissue. Um, so what do we do? We're we're making sure when we got that placenta out, we would examine it carefully to see if we have evidence of anything missing. Um, even if you thought it was complete, if you're in a situation where a woman's bleeding is not controlled, it is worth it to go back and look again. Um, to see if anything was missed in that first examination, to open the chucks pad up where the placenta is, to take another look, to take a look at both sides, to get the flashlight out if the light's not good, to see if there's um, something that you may have missed there. Um, particularly if you think she may have fragments inside, this is where methogen is indicated. This is an indication for methogen because of the way it contracts the uterus. If she doesn't have any of the risk factors that would make that contraindicated, remember that would be high blood pressure or any uh, concerns that you may have had about preeclampsia, then that would not be indicated. You may not also have it. Um, if you did not have methogen, this might be a point where you consider your dosage of Cytotec, which increases the overall tone of the uterus. Again, when we consider these things, we're thinking, you know, we know that they have some side effects, but there are more side effects from continuing to bleed than there are potentially from the side attack. So at that point, we realize, you know, it would be better to give her 800 micrograms of side attack than for her to continue to bleed. That's one more tool in my arsenal. I'm going to add that to the effects of the Pitocin. So now we have two different agents working to help her uterus clamp down. This is not the only order these medications may be utilized. This is a this is one recommended order based on evidence and studies that we have on how they work. Um, a big thing at this point is not to underestimate blood loss. Um, hospitals have now moved uh, primarily from estimating blood loss, EBL to QBL. Um, at home birth settings, we're still basically doing EBL. So it's really important to keep our skills sharp, no matter how experienced we are. It never hurts to you know take a minute and see if we're estimating correctly in our off time. Um, we've all, I think all of us at some point have been to, to a workshop where we estimated blood loss and poured colored jello liquid on Chuck's pads and in kidney dishes and placenta pans to practice. Never anything wrong with that. Um, keep in mind, just in general, if you've got a full soaked Chuck's pad, 
you've got anywhere from one to two cups, which is 250 to 500 milliliters of blood, that can add up pretty fast. If you're changing Chux pads underneath somebody while they're bleeding, put those in a place where you can check them and count them later. I know we're, a lot's happening, Chux pads are getting changed, thrown in the trash. You wanna keep track of that because later that's gonna let you know how much recovery time your mom's gonna need. Um, you really want to make sure the mom is not pooling blood behind her back that you don't see if your bed's soft or she's on a couch. Um, there's that hidden, hidden bleed. If she's on a firm, flat surface, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. The flatter she is, the easier it is to see what's going on. If she's sitting up or if her bed is soft, she could be losing blood that you're not seeing and it could be pooling behind her, um, which will affect your management, how much she's lost. Um, so keep in mind, and this is our, our individualizing how much blood a woman can safely use. A woman's gonna use, lose half a point of hemoglobin for every cup of blood, 250 milliliters. So if she's got a nice hemoglobin of 12, she can tolerate more blood loss than a woman starting at 11 or 10 and a half. So this is again, where knowing different women's risks and tolerance for how much blood they can lose is very individual based on their labs going into labor. It's a lot harder to keep track of blood loss at a water birth. Um, here's a nice little overall indicator here. Um, some midwives because of that, um, always get a mom routinely out of the birth tub um, as soon as, they deliver the baby in order to do the placenta on the bed just so that they can see that. Um, that's one option to consider. Otherwise, you're going to have to watch a little bit more closely. Um, if when in doubt, you can give Pitocin and then get her out of the tub. Pitocin, typically we always give it in the thigh. You can also give it in the arm. It's still IM and then get her out with that on board to help control her hemorrhage. Um, Another scenario, if the cord avulses, comes off, or a partial placenta comes out while the woman's bleeding heavily. So this is a less common and more concerning scenario, like everybody's most dreaded, least favorite, maybe not most dreaded. It's probably one of my least favorite complications to manage. Um, obviously, we're doing everything we can by not pulling on the cord, not doing fun fiddling to be a contributing cause to this, but there may be a situation where it happens even when we were taking all the steps for it not to happen. First thing, take a deep breath. Next thing, there's two things that need to happen almost simultaneously. Your assistant needs to call 911 and immediately administer Pitocin. Uh, you wanna get both of those things going immediately. If she's, unless she's pouring blood, take a minute to put on fresh sterile gloves, make eye contact and tell the woman you need to reach inside and get the rest of the placenta. So the only way we can make this woman stop bleeding is to get the part of the placenta out that's still inside, right? Um, we are not supposed to do this unless it is an emergency technique and it needed as an emergency, which in this case it is. So don't hesitate. This is where we need to get the placenta out. We slide our hand inside and follow the curve of her uterus and remove contents. It is a life-saving measure. It's um, incredibly painful to do on an unanesthetized woman and you wanna make sure that she's got somebody helping her breathe through that. Um, as soon as you feel everything out, you want to massage the uterus, administer methogen and or cytotec and or more Pitocin. Keep a hand or hand on her fundus and eyes on her vagina for blood loss monitoring. Run an IV if one has not already been run and consider adding Pitocin. And even if your patient is stable, if this kind of complication happens and you manage it, you want to consider transporting um, she may need a blood transfusion. She may need antibiotics. It's not natural um, for a woman to have that invasive procedure, and she may need some antibiotics to prevent infection. Please keep in mind, this is, um, this is a traumatic event for both the midwife and the, and the mother. It, it may be necessary for life-saving, but um, keep in mind, she may need trauma therapy, and the midwife might need some separate trauma therapy of her own. 
this is just the reality of that. It's not natural to have your hand inside somebody's body um, while they're unanesthetized. Um, and however, I do want to say retained placenta, the statistics, I actually looked these up this morning because we're all hoping like we never have to do this, but retained placenta, two to three percent of vaginal deliveries in developed countries. Um, Probably every midwife will have to do that. This at least once, if not twice or three times in her career, not my favorite. Um, this picture in no way, these pictures in no way um, capture the intensity um, and visceral experience of this procedure, but that's what's happening. These are both, these are images of hands on the outside Bundle pressure after placenta can be done with two hands in these positions, two hands in these positions. By manual compression, if you're transporting a woman after her placenta's out, um, this is a procedure where if a woman has uncontrolled bleeding and needs to go to the hospital, um, you would have one hand inside and one hand outside. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna buzz through these pretty fast because I don't wanna I, we're, we're slightly off our schedule, but I want to be really respectful of TBLRs. Um, they're really good at keeping on time, so I don't want to don't want to mess that up. Um, when to transport? Bleeding is uncontrolled before or after placenta. The placenta cannot be delivered or has partially delivered, and the patient is bleeding. Patient is going into shock. You know, signs of shock: low blood pressure, high pulse, disorientation, pale, clammy skin, or fainting. The placenta has not been delivered with an appropriate amount of time, even without bleeding. There's a lot of discussion about what an appropriate amount of time is there, but I will just leave it there for this time. Important tip, if you have any doubt in the middle of managing any of these scenarios or any variation of these scenarios, that you're going to be able to manage it, that this is going to end in a way that you can stabilize your patient at home. Go ahead and have someone call 911 to have their just in case. If everything is great, you can always send them away when they get there. If everything is not great, they're there and they can take them to the hospital. I have sent people away. I have been very glad they were there when they got there. How to transport? Remember, you call 911 and then the hospital, right? You're going to always, if you make one call, make two. 911 is to get your transport. Your second call is that hospital that you've already got on your list with your phone number already listed. Tell them what's happening, patient status and blood type. You're stabilizing her. You're not going to stop managing her situation. Just because they come in the door, you're going to maintain your fundal pressure or by manual compression or put on that anti-shock garment we talked about. If you've got an 18 gauge IV run, that's helpful. But otherwise, that's something the ambulance crew is going to be able to place when they get there. Remember when they come in the door, you want to identify your team lead. Who's the team lead today? You're going to calmly make eye contact and give an accurate report of what's happening, last vitals, all medication given. You're going to treat them as colleagues who've come to help. You actually know more than they do uh, as far as anything to do with um, obstetrical emergencies, but you want to treat them respectfully as colleagues and try to elicit their cooperation. You want to stay with your patient at all possible, but don't delay transport. Things are very different now because of COVID. We used to go a lot more than we go now. If you're going, take I am Pitocin in the transport with you because the ambulance drivers will not have that. And if you're transporting a mom for hemorrhage, you want to leave another midwife with the baby to bring later if necessary. This is your aftercare. Um, there is a long postscript to a successfully controlled hemorrhage at home or a birth center. You want to prepare for a long postpartum. Most of these things are people or things that, you know, everybody's tired, but there's going to be a long follow up. These are not things all of us are unfamiliar with. Um, I do want to emphasize that you want to make sure she's got that solid adult support at home. She's more likely to have extra issues with breastfeeding. She's going to need a lot more follow up. Even if you don't normally do home visits, this would be an indicator to make sure she gets some extra support. Um, that is my final slide. I felt like I'm kind of speed talking at the end, but I want to make sure 
like I said, we've got some other great presenters ready. Katie, that is it. I'm going to hand back to you. Thanks, Roxanne. Um, we have opened up the Q&A, and I would like to um, be able to see if anybody has any questions. I'll read them out and uh, have Roxanne answer as time allows. You should be able to see a little Q&A button down at the bottom portion of your screen. You can click on that and type in a question if you have one. Um, if you get this, please, uh, in the drop down menu, select Katie Bryce as the panelist and submit the question to Katie Bryce. I will be the moderator for um, the questions. I'll pull up this screen real quick so that you can see the instructions again about um, selecting the panelist of Katie Bryce and then submit your question. So you'll read them to me, Katie. Is that how that works? Yes. Okay. Okay, we have a comment from Janet saying, great job, Roxanne. I agree. <laughs> Janet. Wonderful presentation. Um, okay, let's see if I can. I am trying to find the questions for this. I'm trying to scroll through it. Okay, it says, great job. I've seen Pitocin and Cytotec used together during a clear PPH. Is this not advised? No, it's it's okay. They can be used together if because you're going to get the, the immediate um, response from your Pitocin within 7 to 10 minutes, and then you're going to get your sustained from your side attack. They're not contraindicated. If you feel they're both indicated, they can both be given together. Um, one question is, I would like to know, oh, well, this is a question for everybody in general. Um, sorry, as a new question comes up, the other question disappears for me. So I'm having a hard time getting to them. Um, sorry, Roxanne. No, it's okay. You're doing an amazing job. I'm, um, I'm so impressed with how we're figuring all this out. I'm not able to make, how do you manage your stress and keep calm when things go very hectic? <sighs> um, I think always, take a deep breath, whether that's, you know, literal or internal, a pause. While it seems like you might be wasting time, you're actually not like you're not you're not delaying or hesitating. But there's that place in your head where you're like, this is happening. I'm going to deal with this. This is what I need to do next. I think having practiced the scenarios a lot and having them in your head. OK. OK, you just go into muscle memory. I know what I need to do. I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. And, yeah, you, know, you can you can have a meltdown in the shower later. I think most of us do that. <laughs> We're all going to have a meltdown later. It's in the moment. Just deep breaths, calm and also understanding that staying calm is literally part of the management technique, because the calmer I stay, the more I can get the mom to cooperate with me. And the better outcome I'll be. So I think of that like that's just as important as my Pitocin, right? That's that's part of that's one of the steps. Step one, stay calm. Okay, I think we'll do one more question. I know that we have more than um, just one more, but in, to save time, we can only get to one more. And I believe we'll be able to keep track of these questions. You can always um, contact Roxanne for more information, and we will have the presentation available on our um, website for viewing later. So the last question, can you speak on using the placenta to stop a hemorrhage? Is that a thing? Um, it is a thing. We don't have any studies, um, any any controlled studies with um, statistical outcomes. So that would be like um, an anecdotal um, 
method, much like a lot of other things traditional midwives use, which doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means that we can't consider it evidence-based according statistically, but using, I have a colleague who works in a very under-resourced area who says that taking a piece of the placenta sublingually and having the mom hold it under her tongue can control hemorrhage. Obviously, if I have Pitocin or other means, I wouldn't be doing that. If I'm beside the road and that's all I've got, sure. I would never use that as a first line response, but it's out there. Okay, thank you very much.